welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us today. This webinar series is for dairy producers and veterinarians that would like to get more value out of their relationship with Central Star. The first 30 minutes will be a presentation, uh, but feel free to type questions in the chat along the way. Once the presentation portion is over, we'll open the floor for additional questions and discussions. Don't be shy. You joined us because you want to know more, and we want to give you the information you need. Today's episode, Vaccination is Only One Step in Stopping the BVD Cycle, will teach you the impact of BVD on production, reproduction, and your bottom line, why you need more than a vaccination program, strategies to prevent BVD from entering or re-entering your herd, and more. The goal is to provide you with insights and strategies for BVD prevention, diagnosis, and management, which will enhance your biosecurity program and ultimately your profitability. So let's get started with a few introductions. I'm Michelle Kaufman, the Customer Solutions Advisor for Central Star Cooperative. I consult with producers to design testing strategies and implement results into real-world management decisions. To help us better understand bovine viral diarrhea virus, or BVD, I have Dr. Jen Roberts, Dairy Professional Services Veterinarian with Bowringer Ingelheim Animal Health, also known as BI. Dr. Roberts grew up on a dairy farm in Southern Michigan and received her DVM degree from Michigan State University's College of Veterinary Medicine in 2005. She then worked as an associate and eventual owner in a food animal practice in Southwest Wisconsin for seven years. Dr. Roberts returned to Michigan State University to teach bovine and small ruminant reproduction and dairy production medicine. In the fall of 2019, she joined BI as a dairy professional services veterinarian. She continues to hold an adjunct professor appointment at Michigan State University and routinely provides guest lectures on reproduction and production medicine in dairy practice. So thank you, Dr. Roberts, for taking the time to join us today. And now I turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Michelle, for that introduction. And thanks for inviting me to join this call today. So as Michelle said, I'm going to be um, spending about 30 minutes here with you guys talking about um, some of the impacts of BBD in the herd. And um, going along with that is the fact that vaccination is just one step in stopping the BVD cycle in the herd. So first of all, um, BVDV is also known as bovine viral diarrhea virus. It got that name because when it was first identified, a lot of the clinical signs that were seen were diarrhea. But as we'll talk throughout this presentation, there are so many more impacts in the herd than just diarrhea. BVD is an RNA virus, and one of the characteristics of RNA viruses is that they can mutate readily to um, you know, try to maintain their persistence within a population. We see two types of disease with BVD. They can either experience transient or acute infections or persistent infections. The persistent infection is going to be the smallest proportion of infections, less than 5%, but these are also going to be the most costly. The persistently infected calf is a calf that acquires the virus from the dam while in utero, either because the dam herself is persistently infected or because the dam is exposed to the virus at a point in gestation where the calf can become persistently infected. Calves that are persistently infected with BVD have this infection for the duration of their life. And because they don't recognize the BVD virus as foreign and it's able to live and replicate within the calf, this calf is a, or this persistently infected animal is a major source of viral shedding in the herd. The majority of infections we see, however, are transient infections. So these are going to be infections that are acquired from other animals in the herd after the animal is born. These typically will only last a few weeks because in the case of a transient infection, the animal has a competent immune system that's able to respond to the invading virus, mount an immune response, and clear the virus from the animal's body. These animals are a minor source of viral shedding. 
So we have the transient infection, the animal clears it, moves on. The persistent infection, that animal is infected for life and is a major source of viral shedding and infection to the other animals in the herd. Why do we worry about BVD? Why is it important to consider eliminating this from our herd or implementing biosecurity practices to prevent its introduction into the herd? BVD is capable of causing a lot of disease impacts. Um, it's a very potent immuno, it's a very potent immunosuppressive, and so um, it can cause decreased immune function. It can also cause respiratory and reproductive disease. From a reproductive disease standpoint, what we'll see is a reduction in first service conception rates. We can also see early embryonic death, abortions, and birth defects. And then the most costly um, outcome is that PI calf that is going to constantly be shedding the virus and creating um, problems within the rest of the herd. <clears throat> When we look at the economic impact of BVD, um, there's a variety of things to consider. So with production losses, we can see nearly $70 loss per animal in the case of a BVD infection. But these production losses can be increased, um, almost doubled actually, if both of these criteria are met within the herd. If the BVD introduction risk is high, so if it's an, an open herd situation where there's a lot of animals being brought into the herd um, and there's high risk of introducing the virus. And if viral circulation was high in the herd, we had an additional cost added on to those production losses. So in that case, if there's uh, PI animals coming in or you have a lot of animals that are transiently infected and there's a high level of virus circulating throughout the herd, we're going to see more production losses. A lot of it is due to the immune function being suppressed in these animals, and then we see other diseases showing up. So to summarize all of those impacts of BVD, it's really going to affect the whole herd. So if we have a BVD infected animal, um, it can be shedding the virus into the water, the environment in general, the feed bunks, and can also serve as a source of exposure to the healthy calf or cows in the herd. And subsequent to all of these exposures to BVD in the environment, feedstuffs and water, we can see stillbirths, respiratory disease, reproductive diseases, diarrhea, and even death as a result of BVD circulating within the herd. So as you can see from all of the diseases that we know can be caused by BVD and the economic impacts, it's really important to focus on eliminating this virus from the herd. So there's a couple of different ways that BVD virus can be transmitted within the herd. So we can have vertical transmission where a cow that's pregnant is exposed to the virus either from an animal that is shedding the, the virus into the environment or if the cow herself is persistently infected and then the virus is able to cross the placenta and cause infection of the calf and produce a PI calf. The other route of transmission is horizontal transmission. So that would be where we have a PI calf, a persistently infected calf, in the herd shedding virus all the time and exposing healthy immune competent animals and sometimes even though we've got a vaccinated herd the level of exposure of this virus can sometimes overwhelm that immune response and that protection that's provided by the vaccine and we can see breakthrough infections and so you know while vaccination is a really important component of preventing BVD in the herd, it's only one piece of the puzzle. And so um, our PI calves are going to be the main source of infection, but we can also see some spread of BVD within the herd by those acutely infected animals.
So these calves that become persistently infected in utero um, can either be born dead, um, they may be weak or small. And when I was going through veterinary school and we were learning about persistently infected calves as a source of BVD, um, we were told that they were going to be weak, poor doers, easily picked out of the herd. Um, but, but sometimes they can be born normal and they may live to adulthood. And so it can be very difficult sometimes to pick out the PI calves just based on appearance alone. So a calf that is persistently in, infected and um, does live to calfhood and on to adulthood is going to constantly be shedding this virus. And this constant viral shed is going to result in acute infections in the healthy animals within the herd. And then because of those acute infections, associated immune suppression that occurs with infection with BVD virus, we can see other BVD associated diseases such as scours, pneumonia, and pink eye, just to name a few. And so one of the, the things that will sometimes tip me off in a disease investigation that we might be thinking about considering BVD as a potential cause is if we're seeing constant disease challenge in a group of animals, non-responsive to therapy, and um, you know, potentially some poor doers in the group, but certainly if we're seeing a high incidence of these common calf hood diseases that are um, not responding to treatment, considering testing for BVD might be a consideration in that disease workup. When we look at the older animals in the herd, if we have PIs that manage to live into um, breeding age or even into the lactating herd, we're going to see similar issues with that PI animal constantly shedding virus. And then that, res that exposure to virus of the healthy animals in the herd is going to increase their susceptibility to other infectious diseases such as pneumonia, metritis, mastitis, or diarrhea. We also run the risk of PI calf formation. So now we have a PI animal that's in the breeding pens and constantly shedding that virus. And so we're going to have cows and heifers that are pregnant and are at an appropriate point of gestation where the calf could become persistently infected. And so then that continues the cycle of creating more PIs and maintaining the viral circulation within the herd. Um, and so identifying these persistently infected animals and eliminating them is going to be critically important for stopping the cycle of um, viral transmission in the herd. And then we can also see reproductive failures in this age group as well. So there's a couple of types of BVD. Um, the two most common types that we see are type one and two. And these are further broken down into subtypes. Um, with type one, the most common subtypes that we see are 1A and 1B. And with type two, although there's 2A and 2B, um, we don't see a lot of 2B in the United States, uh, but we do see 2A. All of our commercially available vaccines contain types 1A and 2A. And so, um, the challenge that we face in controlling BVD is that the subtype 1B is actually the most common subtype shed by persistently infected animals. And the type 1A is the type that's contained in the vaccines. So if you are vaccinating for BVD, it's important to select a strain of type 1A that's going to provide cross protection against um, both types 1A and 1B. So this chart here is showing some data um, over about the last 30 years or so, um, looking at the subgenotype distribution of BVD and how it has changed over time. So the light blue is BVD type 1A, the darker blue is 1B, and the gray is 2A. So as you can see in um, 
the late 80s, the samples that were submitted to diagnostic labs were split pretty close to 50-50 between um, types 1A and 1B. When we look 10 years later in, in the late 90s, now that distribution has shifted to um, less type 1A and about 50% of the isolates were 1B. Going another decade out into 2008, um, we see more shift towards that type 1B subgenotype and about 60% of the isolates that were, or the BBD samples that were sent to diagnostic labs at that time um, were BBD type 1B. We also have a website where we track cases, um, bbdbtracker.com, and this is the, the data that was current as of September 16th of this year. And you can see that, um, you know, now we're about another decade out from that data set on the previous slide, and the prevalence of 1B is continuing to increase with um, a total sample set of about 1,200 cases that have been typed and 71% of those have been type 1B. <clears throat> so when we focus on BVD control, there's really three key components. The first is to practice good biosecurity. The second is to identify and eliminate those persistently infected animals that we've already discussed as being the most important source of viral shed on the farm. And then finally, enhancing immunity through a good vaccination strategy. So we'll start off with biosecurity. And, um, you know, the, the question I pose here with biosecurity is, does the closed herd really exist? Um, even if you're not purchasing animals and bringing new herd additions in, there's many visitors on dairy operations now. We have milk truck drivers, we have um, coal, trail, coal cow trailers that are coming and going that have been around to multiple farms, um, veterinarians and nutritionists, feed delivery trucks, um, contract haulers and visitors, and then university and extension personnel. So there's a whole list there. Um, and I'm sure we could probably think of more people that are visiting our farms on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but those are probably the most common. Um, and so the question I have for you is, does your farm require boots or a foot bath for visitors? So, you know, that's a, a pretty simple and easy way. Um, you know, that's just one piece of the biosecurity question, um, but it's a start. Um, requiring boots or foot baths for visitors can help to decrease any um, tracking of infectious diseases to and from your farm. So from a biosecurity standpoint, there's several practices that um, can increase the risk of bringing BVD into the herd. Um, so the first one there on the top left is using heifer raisers who don't have BVDV biosecurity protocols. So making sure that if you are using a contract heifer raiser, they're requiring BVD testing for all animals coming into that facility to ensure the health of your animals as well as the health of all the other animals in that um, facility. Um, failure to test all new herd additions for PI status so anytime you're purchasing new additions for the herd, it'd be advisable to at minimum ear notch those animals to test for BVD. Um, failure to disinfect loaned equipment before returning it, uh, before it's returned to the farm of origin. So if you share trailers with the neighbors or other equipment, make sure that that is disinfected before bringing it back onto your farm. Purchase of bred heifers or cows of unknown origin. So again, um, you know, this would be like a sale barn situation where these, the origin and vaccination status of these animals is unknown and then failing to quarantine them um, when they arrive or failing to test them is going to increase that risk of bringing BVD into the farm. Um, another thing to consider is animals that go out to, um, shows, expos, or fairs. It'd be a good practice to quarantine those animals when they do return because 
there's potential for disease exposure in those um, situations as well. And then um, final, the final risky practice that we have here is failure to use a BVD vaccine that has proven cross protection for that subtype 1B. One of the big biosecurity risks for BVD is um, a heifer that returns from a grower um, or a, a heifer raising facility that's carrying a PI calf. So this is, you know, with more and more farms sending their heifer, heifers off to contract raisers, it is important to consider the biosecurity of these breeding age heifers. And so, um, you know, at minimum, ear notching these animals when they go to the, the heifer grower or choosing a heifer grower that requires BVD testing can help to reduce that risk. So um, we can test new herd additions, quarantine for two to three weeks after arrival to try to reduce our BVD risk and exposure. And then another way that we can um, test the, the dam is to test calves that are born after they return from a contract heifer raising facility. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the ways that we can get a PI calf is if the dam herself is a PI. And so if we test a calf and the calf is not a PI, then we know that the dam is not a PI because a PI dam will always give birth to a PI calf. And so if you're just getting started with BVD testing, testing newborn calves is one way that you can kind of get a two for one test um, because if the calf is negative, we know that the dam is not a PI. So with those PIs being the main source of viral shedding on the farm, um, there's a few things to consider in identification and elimination of those persistently infected animals. So first of all, to try to minimize the amount of virus that's shed into the environment and minimize the impact on the health of the other animals on the farm, I re would recommend testing calves prior to 60 days of age so that if there are persistently infected animals, we can identify them quickly and eliminate them from the herd. Um, the PI positive calves should be culled from the herd. And when I say they should be culled from the herd, um, if they're large enough to go to slaughter, that would be okay. Um, but if we're testing them prior to 60 days of age, the primary method of culling them from the herd is going to be humane euthanasia. And then because we know that a PI cow will always give birth to a PI calf, if we haven't tested the dam of an identified PI calf, we also want to go back and test that dam. She may have just been exposed to the virus during that critical point of gestation to create a PI calf, and she herself is not a PI, or she could be a persistently infected animal as well. And so we want to go back and test that dam of any calves that are identified as persistently infected to make sure that we don't have an adult PI animal that's shedding virus into the adult herd. <clears throat> so on this picture here, um, I'd ask you to, to look across this group of calves and see if you can identify the PI. And you know the, the main point here is that it could be any one of those calves. Um, we know now that the persistently infected calf can be healthy and normal appearing and can thrive in a, um, a group pen situation and not be able to be identified from the rest of the group. So it could be the calf that's standing against the back wall there in the corner, or it could be the one that's just slightly smaller that's up here at the feed bunk. The key here is that it's not possible to pick those animals out just by visually assessing the pen. We really need to test those animals to identify the persistently infected ones and remove them from the herd so that they're not negatively impacting the health of the other animals. So when we think about testing for BVD, we have a variety of options available. Um, the ear notch, 
can be used. Um, so in this case, you would use uh, an ear notching tool. The one I always used was the same one we used for notching pig ears. Um, and you just take that small piece of ear tissue and send that off to the lab. You can also um, collect a blood sample. It's important to check with the lab what their requirements are on blood samples though, because um, that can vary depending on the age of the animal. Um, and then you can also test for BVD in milk. So with the milk test, you can either test individual animals or you can look at screening a bulk tank to see if there are any, um, if there's any animals in the lactating herd. Again, if you're going to do bulk tank screening, however, it's important to contact the lab and find out what the maximum number of cows going into that bulk tank can be to still have confidence that you're going to be able to pick out a single PI animal in that group based on the sample size. The test methods that we use um, commonly are ELISA tests or PCR. And so um, they're both going to be helpful in identifying the BVD status of an animal, but the ELISA test is going to detect antibodies against BVD. So that'll tell us if there's been um, viral exposure and the PCR is actually going to detect and amplify the viral DNA and identify the virus itself. So um, both testing methods are going to work, but they, um, they do detect different components of the infection. Um, finally, we'll just wrap up here with a few comments on vaccination. So we want to select vaccines for BVD that are going to provide fetal protection. So um, when you're making that choice for a vaccine to protect your cows against the reproductive effects and in particular, the persistently infected animal, um, it's important to find a vaccine that is going to provide that fetal protection and prevent persistently infected animals. We also need to get that vaccine into those cows and heifers prior to breeding. So if our goal is to provide protection for that developing fetus, the cow needs to develop her immunity prior to becoming pregnant. So aiming for about 30 days prior to breeding or a little bit sooner to make sure that we've got plenty of time for the cow to mount her immune response and, be, and for that pregnancy to be protected against the negative effects of BVD um, is the timeline that I would suggest. And then we want to revaccinate these animals annually to maintain protective immunity. One vaccine isn't going to protect them for the rest of their life. And so following the label instructions for a vaccine against BVD and revaccinating annually is going to be important to protect subsequent pregnancies. And then um, in addition to selecting a vaccine that's going to provide that fetal protection, we also want to make sure that we're selecting a vaccine that's going to provide that cross protection against that BVD-1B subgenotype that's most commonly identified in persistently infected animals. Um, and then with calves, um, so thinking about, we've already talked about protecting those cows and heifers prior to breeding, but because calves that are exposed to BVD can be subjected to those immunosuppressive effects of the virus and be more susceptible to other calf hood diseases, or be susceptible to the respiratory disease effects of BVD, we want to make sure that calves are vaccinated prior to their exposure risk. So if there's going to be an exposure risk once they're weaned and they're moved into group pens, you may want to consider including a BVD vaccine prior to that move to a group pen. So to summarize our take home messages today, um, the PI animal, the persistently infected animal is going to be the main source of BVD within um, a dairy herd. And most of those PI animals are going to be shedding subtype 1B. <clears throat> we really need to test in order to detect and remove these PI animals from the herd and maintain the health of all of the other animals in the herd. 
And we also want to implement biosecurity measures so that we can reduce the risk of BVD exposure if the herd is bringing in new additions. And then as part of our BVD control, we want to implement a vaccine protocol that includes an efficacious BVDV vaccine with research proven protection um, for that subtype 1B, as well as um, fetal protection to ensure herd immunity. So that was what I had for you today um, on BVD and the impacts that it can have in the dairy herd. And with that, I'll open it up for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. That was great. So like I had mentioned before, you guys are welcome to type your questions into the chat or feel free to unmute yourselves and ask whatever questions you may have. Let's see, I've got a few here. So let's start with, can a calf become persistently infected after birth? You talked a little bit about where they come from, but is it possible to create a PI animal after birth? So that's, that's a great question. And um, the persistently infected calf occurs only during gestation. Um, so what happens is if the fetus is exposed to the virus, before its own immune system really develops. And, you know, this is gonna be roughly in the 40 to 140 days carried calf. <clears throat> um, so just a little over a month to just a little over three months. In that period of gestation, the calf hasn't yet developed its own immune system. So if the BVD virus gets into the calf, the calf doesn't recognize it as a foreign invader that it needs to mount an immune response against and clear. And so then the virus is able to set up shop in that calf and continue to replicate and thrive. And then that calf is gonna be constantly shedding the virus. If the exposure to the calf happens later in gestation, after that calf has developed its immune system, then the calf will mount an immune response, clear the virus, much like a healthy animal would do after birth. And so um, that persistently infected calf is only going to be formed during gestation, during that very specific window. Um, but you know, it, it then becomes like a little Trojan horse where it's um, just waiting there at the gates, shedding that, waiting to shed its virus out and, and wreak havoc. Absolutely. I appreciated your picture that you showed about pick out the, um, the PI calf because I had a similar situation when I worked for a vet clinic before and a, one of the doctors sent us a video. We had a known PI calf. We had tested it positive and he went to the hutches and said, all right, tell me which one it was. And they all looked the, the same and they all looked fine. Um, so I think that's really a valuable point to make sure that you're testing because you can't see them. You can't tell. Um, so it looks like we've got a couple questions in here. The first one says, what are some vaccines that cover 1B looking for specific brand or company? Um, so the strain, uh, there's two different strains of BVD type 1A that are included in the commercially available vaccines. Um, those are the NADL strain and the Singer strain. And the Singer strain is the strain that's going to provide, that has the research behind it that's going to provide um, a lot of cross protection against that type 1B. There's um, you know, research that's proven that um, that strain is going to provide cross protection against type 1B. Next question says, if you have a higher level of unviable twins, early embryonic death, and abortions, would you think BVD? And how would you define a higher level of these occurrences? So it certainly would be on my list, um, but there's, you know, it, abortion and infertility cases can really um, be frustrating to work up because, um, you know, sometimes by the time you're seeing these abortions um, or early embryonic death, the initial insult is passed. So we're also having to kind of dig into the herd history. 
um, you know, did they get into some bad silage and there were some mycotoxins or aflatoxins that could also cause um, early embryonic losses. Um, with twins and, you know, having um, non-viable twins, that's one of those things that, you know, if I only have that, I'm not thinking infectious disease right off the bat because twinning um, is one of the most common causes of non-infectious abortion in cattle. Um, and we'll see a lot of, um, you know, in one study, that I have read in the past up to 25% either reduction or loss um, of the entire pregnancy when you do have twins. So, um, you know, we do see a lot of losses of those. Um, as far as abortions, when it gets over about a 5% incidence, that's when I start getting concerned that I need to be working up the problem and, you know, determining is it an infectious component or is it nutrition related or toxins in the feed or, you know, heat stress or, you know, there's, there's a whole variety of things that can cause um, clinical symptoms that look very similar, but certainly BVD would be on my list, especially if they were bringing in a lot of herd additions and there was a potential there for introduction of the virus. So along those lines, what are some of the other things, some of the other problems a herd could bring to you? that they're noticing clinically throughout their herd that would make you think, I need to screen for BVD, <laughs> potentially among other things, but would put BVD on your list of things to be concerned? Um, so in the calves, um, what I've seen clinically is, you know, groups of calves where we're just battling respiratory disease on an ongoing basis. Um, we're treating the calves, you know, we're identifying the cases. Um, early, we're treating with an appropriate antimicrobial, and then we're not seeing response to treatment. You know, the calves are having to be retreated. They're, you know, not recovering. And, um, you know, so that's a tip off to me that I need to look for, you know, something that might be causing altered immune function in these animals. Um, you know, certainly reproductive effects that we would see with an increase in early embryonic losses um, or abortions, you know, and sometimes we'll see um, there are some congenital defects that can be caused by BVD as well. So, um, you know, we, we can see some things like um, calves that are born with um, deformities and stuff like that. So like a shorter jaw or really small eyes or um, hydrocephalus, kind of that water on the brain, um, congenital defect. And so, um, you know, congenital defects are something that would also tip me off to, to looking at BVD, at least having it on my list of possible causes. Um. One of the things that we haven't touched on yet, uh, we've talked a lot about dairy cows. What about beef cows? Do beef producers need to be concerned at all about BVD and the effects it could potentially have for them? Yeah, certainly. So today's, um, you know, content really focused a lot on dairy animals, but beef cattle are affected by BVD as well in all of the same ways. It's going to cause you know, it's going to cause immune suppression. It's going to cause an increase in pneumonia, um, an increase in calf hood diseases, reproductive losses. And so, um, you know, we can see all of those same impacts in the beef herd. And it can be very detrimental to the, um, the productivity of the beef herd as well. You know, if you've got calves, that are experiencing a constant challenge with exposure to BVD and they're not as thrifty or healthy as they could be if we didn't have BVD circulating in that herd. Um, you know, it's going to impact their average daily gains, which can impact their weaning weights. And then, you know, that impacts the profitability for that producer. So, um, you know, we can see an increase disease incidence in the feedlot. And so across all aspects of beef cattle production, BVD can be a problem there as well. And in terms of beef producers, do you recommend the same strategies that you do for dairy as far as biosecurity, <laughs> vaccination and testing? Yep, absolutely. So um, those concepts are going to, um, and practices for prevention are going to apply broadly across all cattle. 
from, you know, any, any herd, beef or dairy, biosecurity, vaccination and testing. I appreciated your point about um, a closed herd. That's something I get a lot that people insist that they have a closed herd and so they don't have to be concerned about various diseases coming in. And I just wanted to remind everybody that a closed herd isn't always necessarily what you think it is. And like you said, it, is that even really truly possible with the amount of people we have coming and going, uh, with the amount of um, visitors we have, with trucks coming in and out, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of reiterate that to people. I think it's extremely important to think about. Um, so along those lines, um, I also, one of the things I get pushed back on is people say, well, I use a vaccine, so I don't have to test. If the vaccine is so good, why do I need to test for it? So what would be your response to that? If I have, if the vaccine works, why should I test? So we do have some very effective uh, vaccines on the market and the efficacy of the vaccine is also going to depend on the type of vaccine that you're using. So we have modified live virus vaccines um, and we have killed vaccines. And so the modified live vaccines tend to um, stimulate a little bit more robust and a little bit longer lasting immunity and better fetal protection against BVD persistently infected fetuses than our killed vaccines. And so, um, you know, some herds and, and a lot of beef herds actually will use a killed vaccine because they're oftentimes vaccinating either cows that, um, they're either vaccinating calves that are still suckling on the cows or the time that they're bringing those animals through the chute to vaccinate, they're already pregnant. And so um, for, you know, if they haven't seen a modified live vaccine prior to pregnancy, we can really only use a killed vaccine when they're pregnant. And so um, even with our modified live vaccines that are going to stimulate very good immunity that's a little bit longer lasting and provides very good protection for those fetuses, um, no vaccine is 100%. There's a lot of factors to consider. There's handling of the vaccine, administration of the vaccine. You know, it needs to be maintained in a cool temperature. It needs to be administered in the proper location. Um, you know, and then we've got animal factors to consider as well. Um, what's the, the health status of that animal on the day of vaccination? Are we vaccinating on a hot summer day where those animals are, are stressed? Do they have concurrent disease? You know, there's a lot of things that we can um, do to try to prevent disease, but then there's also a lot of factors that influence the responsiveness um, to the vaccine. And so um, no vaccine is 100%, and there's always going to be that potential for um, breakthrough, even with a robust vaccination program. So, you know, the testing and the vaccination really need to go hand in hand. Absolutely. And one thing I would add to your, you know, the, the previous question about the, uh, or comments about the closed herd, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're in Michigan and, um, in Michigan, we are all very aware of how diseases can be transmitted from wildlife reservoirs. Um, you know, we've gone through decades here of, of deer being responsible for transmitting TB into our dairy herds. And so, um, you know, or, or beef herds. And, you know, that's another thing to consider that even if you don't have a lot of visitors to your farm and you're not bringing in new additions and you're not taking animals to show and bringing them back onto site, um, if your farm is in an area where you're in close proximity to wildlife, there's potential for the wildlife reservoirs of some of these diseases to bring them to the herd as well no chance of any of the farms in Michigan being close to wildlife. <laughs> Absolutely, that's a very good point. That, yeah, the deer are probably eating out of the silage bunker. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yep. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, testing calves specifically and then following up with dams. Is there a specific age limit to when you can perform the test? 
So you can really perform the test at any age. Um, the type of test that you can do is going to um, vary based on the lab. And so, you know, it's really important to check with the lab as far as what their age limits are. But really, we could be testing as soon as that calf hits the ground. We could be testing um, these animals for BVD. But, you know, making sure that we're not having any interference with the test from maternal antibodies, from colostrum, um, you know, that would be a question for the lab to determine if they have a cut point for what's the minimum age for each particular test. Perfect. But the sooner, the better, in my mind. The sooner we can ear notch those calves. And, you know, one of the strategies is um, collecting ear notches and um, freezing those samples until we've got enough animals that we can pool them together, um, because that's one strategy that we can use to decrease the per animal cost of testing is pooling ear notches. And then if, that, if the pool is negative, we know all of the animals in the pool are negative, um, if the pool is positive, then the lab typically will save those ear notches until they have the pool results and they can go back and test each individual notch to identify the PI in the group. But, um, you know, you might it might take a couple of weeks to get enough samples to send in for a pool. Um, but the sooner we can get those cows tested, the better. Absolutely. And that honestly, that leads right into, um, that was a great explanation of actually how Central Star does our diagnostic testing for BVD. Um, so we offer both the PCR and ELISA that you mentioned. So we'll often, one of our most widely used strategies is just like you explained, the ear notches on calves, people will freeze them. And depending on the size of the operation, maybe they're sending samples to us once a week or once a month and then we'll pool those with a PCR test. If that PCR comes back positive, we'll run an ELISA follow-up to find out which animal specifically was positive. Um, but all of that is stuff that we handle right here in the lab, the pooling strategy, the retesting, all of that. Um, so that's something that Central Star can help you get started if you're interested. Um, and then we also do the ELISA testing as well. We can do testing on DHI samples. So we have a lot of options for anybody that's interested in getting started with that. Um, I think as Dr. Roberts has very eloquently pointed out, there are a lot of reasons that you should be doing this, looking into it and paying attention to BVD. And there are multiple different steps you have to take to make sure that you're set up for success. You can't, it's not a one and done thing. You have to make sure you're doing the vaccinations in a timely manner, the way that the instructions say you're supposed to, giving those to a healthy animal for the best success. You're supposed to be following up with doing the testing, making sure you don't have that um, virus pressure floating around the herd to cause issues with the vaccine, and then making sure you're reducing your risk of bringing in that virus to begin with. So doing everything you can to keep um, a biosecure facility. So with that, I'm going to put it out to see if we have any final questions before we wrap up, because I think I have gone through all of my questions. You did a great job of going through everything, so I appreciate that. Oh, we've got one more in here. If a purchased animal tests negative on the herd of origin, would it be advisable for the buyer to test again when the animal arrives on the farm? So. I think that depends on the relationship with the farm of origin. If, um, you know, if they have really good records and you have a high degree of confidence that that animal was tested and that the results that are provided are for that animal, um, it wouldn't be necessary to test them again. Um, sometimes records aren't perfect and um, we aren't 100% sure that the animal that they say was tested was, was tested. Um, then it would be advisable to retest. Um, you know, I've seen animals go through a sale barn with an ear notch, and the assumption is, well, it had an ear notch taken out, so it was tested for BVD, but, you know, we don't um, always know what the test result was or if it actually was negative. Right, absolutely. Great point. Thank you. like that covers all of our questions so 
as we wrap things up today, I want to remind you all that if you'd like more information or you're ready to get started with BBD testing, reach out to your trusted Central Star representative. They will know how to get you started and they can get you set up. I will be sending a follow-up email to everyone that registered for this event, which will contain a link to view the recording on our YouTube channel. So this series will continue with new content quarterly. The next episode is expected to take place mid to late January. So if you'd like to register now, simply respond to the email that sent you the invitation for this episode or respond to the follow-up email you will be receiving shortly. If you're watching this as a recording on our YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button and change your alert settings to all so you get notifications whenever we publish new content. Also, follow us on social media like Facebook and LinkedIn to see our upcoming events. So I want to thank Dr. Roberts for sharing everything with us today. Thank you all for joining us, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.